getting towards the end of the home stretch here. Uh, we're at chapter 19. So talk about food or how we grow crops so specifically. Here are the learning objectives. So as we told, talked about before, plants convert carbon dioxide and water with uh, photons from the sun. Uh, it doesn't have to be the sun. You can do is do it indoors if you want, but uh, with a heat with a light, but forms glucose and many other molecules, proteins, alkaloids, and so on. Uh, early agriculture, so humans would plant the plants, they would eat the food, and then they would use the the plants to make clothing and shelter and so on. Very uh, uh, closed loop, labor intensive. I think we can, you know, if you go to take some anthropology classes, you can learn much more about this. It's actually really fascinating. Uh, okay, and here is the, uh, the flow of nutrients. Uh, basically, uh, the, the sun, uh, energy from the sun used to make uh, the plants make food, and uh, animals eat the, the plants, and animals eat other animals, and then they, uh, as we die, they get returned back to the soil, and then nutrients are returned to the soil. So nowadays, though, uh, fertilizers, we've replaced some of these plant nutrients, and we've added uh, them in, in uh, large amounts. So uh, contemporary farming is, we, our crop yields are so much higher than they were in the past. Uh, we'll talk about the Malthusian catastrophes and and whatnot. We already mentioned a little bit about it, but our, our crop yields are huge now. And just like humans, we have macronutrients. We have carbs, fats, and proteins. Uh, the macronutrients are plants, besides carbon dioxide and water, are nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. So plants need those in pretty large amounts. And we talked a bit about nitrogen and fixating nitrogen can be used. Uh, lightning and cyanobacteria can also uh, fixate it. Uh, but we use ammonia uh, and uh, nitrogen fertilizer. We use these very uh, readily. And uh, what can we use? We can just put ammonia in. Uh, we can also use uh, urea, same stuff that we make uh, for with a part of our excretory system. Uh, ammonium sulfate, this is very common. That's a very common uh, uh, what a, a fertilizer. Uh, ammonium nitrate is also very common, used as an explosive, and ammonium phosphate. Ammonium phosphate is nice because it, it adds phosphorus as well and other nutrients. Uh, something to note though, these are all acidic, oh, except for, except for um, ammonia itself. Uh, but these, I guess, let me think. Um, no, no, urea wouldn't be. Uh, but, but we don't use that as much. So the ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, uh, these are very acidic and uh, one of the things, though, to counteract that, uh, lime can be added to the soil to make it more alkaline, or sweeten the soil, as it's called. Oh, did I miss that? Phosphorus. Uh, so phosphorus is used to make uh, DNA and RNA and adenosine triphosphate. So DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA, ribonucleic acid, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So animal bones, uh, we have it in our bones. We have phosphates alongside our DNA, and uh, we can use animal bones uh, to, as a source of phosphate. So uh, one problem, though, about phosphates, um, this can cause eutrophication. Well, this is true for all fertilizers. So in the United States, uh, the uh, so algae will grow until it's limited by some nutrient. In the Mississippi River, it tends to be phosphate, so phosphorus. Uh, so phosphorus causes eutrophication in the uh, Mississippi River Valley and the Gulf of Mexico uh, nitrates. So when uh, spring runoff time comes, you can get algal blooms in the Gulf of Mexico from the, the nitrate fertilizers. So that's one thing of the eutrophication. Uh, potassium is also used by uh, the cell, the the plants, and they use it to balance the fluid in the cells. And it may be involved in protein synthesis. So some of this we're not entirely sure. Oh, and the, and also the transform formation and transportation of carbohydrates. So most commonly we use potassium chloride to do that. Uh, so besides the, the major nutrients, uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium, uh, we have these other 
um, secondary nutrients, magnesium, calcium, and sulfur. We need it in relatively high amounts, not as much as the as the as uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. But there's also eight micronutrients that are needed in, in smaller amounts, and you can see these here. And um, they do various things for the plant as well. So, and let me, you can, I guess you could read that slide yourself. Come on. Okay, so uh, the fertilizers, when you buy a fertilizer, sometimes, a lot of times they have three numbers. The, the, um, the first number is a percent of nitrogen. The second number is the, the percent of diphosphorus penoxide. And then the last number is potassium oxide, sometimes called potash. So those are those numbers. If you ever wonder when you grow up by fertilizer, that's what those numbers mean. Okay, so uh, our contemporary day farming, we use lots of fertilizers, but we also uh, have pesticides. We have uh, pesticides to get rid of pests, get rid of insects, because uh, this would be a major. This is a major food security issue. Insects eating the food before humans can consume it. This is a problem. And here are the various things uh, that we that we can use. So this is two pages of pesticides. And the the idea though is that these these kill the insects before they uh, they can eat the crops. And so here we go there. And uh, when you see these LD fifties. Uh, that stands for lethal dose 50. That's the amount that uh, that will kill 50% of the population. And uh, this one is tested on rats. So generally speaking, the lower the number, the higher the toxicity. So the pyrethrins, for instance, here, the pyrethrins, um, the LD50 there, I won't well, give the range, I'll give the high range. Uh, it's 20, 2,500, 2,600 that's not that toxic so that's a higher number then you look at these other ones here LD50 of 1 that's very highly toxic uh, and uh, let's look at some of the uses that you have here uh, they they put it on various crops and you can see that we have uh, uh, like cotton we grow a lot of cotton so if you look at the the crops that we grow a lot of a lot of wheat a lot of corn a lot of rice, a lot of soybeans, and a lot of cotton. Those are some really big crops that we we have. I'm from Ohio. You can see corn as far as the eye can see when you when you uh, go through Ohio. Okay, so uh, and used to kill insects. Uh, DDT was a very widely used uh, pesticide, and uh, DDT was wonderful. It's a it's a persistent pesticide meaning it sticks around for a long time and it killed lots and lots of mosquitoes that is the animal that is like the deadliest animal to humans that are mosquitoes uh, many people die from mosquitoes because of it's a vector disease carrier so um, and it was an, an ideal insecticide but it, it turned out to cause much environmental damage specifically it caused uh, the fish, uh, the eggshells, to be um, to to get soft and birds of prey. So and it concentrated. This is uh, it was it bioaccumulated. So one thing are these pesticides, uh, especially the 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 um, uh, persistent ones, they can bioaccumulate. So uh, mercury toxicity is an example of bioaccumulation. So higher up on the food chain. So. Uh, the insects would get the uh, get a little bit of DDT. Then, then uh, smaller birds would eat the D eat the uh, the uh, insects that had it. Then a bird of prey would eat that bird uh, that was eating the insects. So the bird of prey ends up getting a higher concentration of that toxin, and that's similar to what's us in mercury because we can we eat fish. The the uh, the Predatory fish are the ones that uh, have a higher levels of mercury, and that can affect us humans, for instance. So, same idea, uh, the bioaccumulation of that, and it caused some damage, environmental damage. So now, instead, what we tend to do is we use organophosphates instead. Uh, what organophosphates are, they are um, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. So, uh, 
acetylcholine is the uh, neurotransmitter associated with motion. So let's say I want to move my arm. My, my brain sends a signal to my arm to move. And the neurotransmitter in between the nerve cells is, is the chemical acetylcholine. And when it's released, then uh, there is something called choline esterase that is released that destroys the acetylcholine. And the reason for that is if, uh, if what that prevents is that the uh, acetylcholine going to another nerve cell and, and activating that and then telling your muscles to flex. So what, what these organophosphates do, they're choline esterase inhibitors, they, uh, they prevent the destruction of acetylcholine and then the, uh, the, all the muscles tighten up. Uh, for humans, our diaphragms, we can't breathe. You either jerk so hard you can break your own back. Uh, you can also, it, uh, death is usually caused by, um, by suffocation uh, from lack of breathing. That's, that's a, a nerve agent. That's how nerve gases work. So organophosphates are just uh, dilute nerve gases that are much more toxic to uh, insects than they are to mammals. But they're, they still work on us. So uh, one thing with that, be careful with these if you use them. So the Malathion, my neighbor uses that stuff. He loves the stuff. Um, okay, uh, carbamates. Uh, these are also insecticides. They're narrow spectrum only at a few uh, pests. So uh, they, they uh, tend not to, they're not nearly as persistent. That's one thing, like DDT was so persistent. This stuff is not very persistent at all. Uh, also so other things, parasites, predatory organisms, microbes, viruses, you can destroy target in insects that way. So it's kind of like getting, getting rid of a rat problem by getting lots of cats. Uh, you can get predatory organisms, things like uh, praying mantises, for instance. And we, we talked about this with nuclear chemistry, releasing sterile insects. So then when the, when the, uh, the insects try to procreate by sexual reproduction, uh, they does not result in a uh, in a um, it's, it's not a pregnancy, but it's not, the the uh, does not an, the the sexual reproduction is ineffective. Uh, pheromones you can use to attract and trap the males. So uh, another in many species, pheromones are released, and that is the signal saying when a females release pheromones when it's time to mate and then uh, the males would be attracted by that pheromone and uh, this way uh, you can trap uh, typically the males. Octanol is a very common pheromone uh, that they they use and you can trap a bunch of insects that way. It's kind of creepy actually when you have that. You have a bag full of insects all looking for the for the ladies. Uh, juvenile hormones, uh, these uh, are used to, they're like, uh, say, birth control pills. They prevent uh, the, uh, the, um, the insects from reaching sexual maturity. So either, either as a, the insects have gone, they, can, they don't reach sexual maturity, or they prevent the larva. So I actually spray this in my own house uh, to, to prevent, uh, to get rid of cockroaches. So uh, I, I use... I use this myself. Okay, so uh, beside oh, and the nice thing about juvenile hormones, um, they're very non-toxic to to mammals. They are very toxic to aquatic life, though. So uh, probably shouldn't spray them outside, but you uh, you can spray them inside. Uh, so herbicides, herbicides, herbicides. I guess if you want from uh, England, I tend to produce. I tend to pronounce the H because I'm eccentric, I suppose. They kill plants, and uh, so herbicides kill weeds, defoliants, uh, get rid of leaves. So uh, two of them were used to make uh, something called Agent Orange. Uh, two for dichlorophenoxyacetic uh, acid, and two, four, five trichloral uh, acid. Uh, pheno, sorry, one, two, four, five, trichlorophenooxy acid. So uh, these two combined uh, was a defoliant called Agent Orange, 
and this was used to uh, destroy the jungle and kill the crops. So, and it had dioxins in it that led to birth defects, and this this effect uh, it um, both the Vietnamese and Americans alike. So, uh, this was if you know the history in the Vietnam War. Uh, but uh, we we use uh, of all the ones. Uh, Atrazine and glycophosphate. Glycophosphate is also known as Roundup. So uh, it's uh, uh, atrazine. It binds to the chloroplast and shuts down the photosynthesis. So corn doesn't doesn't uh, is resistant to this. Uh, so uh, gosh, I, Monsanto is the one that uh, developed glycophosphate. They also have uh, Roundup ready uh, crops. So you can spray Roundup on the crops, and it won't kill them. Um, glycophosphate, it uh, the way it works is it um, it's it's a hormone that makes the uh, the the plant's roots grow, and basically it it's it it grows so hard that it, it kills them, uh, the the weeds. So and glycophosphate is nice because uh, it breaks down into uh, fertilizer, <laughs> so it doesn't stick around for very long. Um, it's like I said, it's used very commonly, uh, and and there there is a question on whether or not it causes cancer. So I I uh, I use this stuff in my yard, and I'm very cautious when I use uh, any any uh, herbicide or pesticide. Uh, but okay, so other ones. Uh, so paraquat, it's a pre-emergent herbicide uh, that prevents photosynthesis. That uh, would be used to reduce the carbon dioxide, so it, it keeps them from uh, emerging from the soil. Okay, and with uh, so uh, let me talk about farming. Uh, so uh, we with with our tech farming techniques, our our farming uh, is uh, well, farm chemicals are the second largest. Uh, category. The largest uh, category of things we produce is transportation fuel. Uh, the second largest thing is is fertilizer, and uh, the so and we use those fertilizer grows our, grow our crops, and we also have completely industrialized our agriculture. So we uh, there's very few agriculture that we have using manual labor, and uh, we have machines that do most of the work and. And because of that, uh, we a very small amount of our population is geared towards food production, uh, as low as maybe uh, five percent. So if you compare that to as perf to earlier in history, so uh, before the industrial revolution, about half of the population was was geared towards feeding the whole population. So it went from a half to about one out of twenty. So we need very few people to feed the uh, the population. Uh, so not only that we've mechanized it, but we also use fertilizer. So our crop yields are much higher, and we have uh, pesticides that we can use to uh, to prevent insects from eating our crops. Uh, and there's other ways not included in here. Uh, so there's um, there's certain types like uh, I think they call them the gut busters. The um, they they put in uh, they put genetically modified uh, uh, genes that uh, if, if certain insects eat the uh, the plant that it causes their stomachs to explode due to a receptor site in their stomachs so uh, they uh, they have I mean there's more more ways than that right so then okay uh, organic farming so organic farming does not use synthetic uh, fertilizers or pesticides uh, but it can use fertilizer it can use mine fertilizers and it can use non-synthetic pesticides, things like nicotine. For instance, nicotine is a wonderful uh, uh, pesticide, but it's also very toxic. Uh, so don't uh, be very careful if you use nicotine. Uh, organic farming tends to have lower yields. Uh, it's also much more labor intensive. Um, and there is some controversy about organic farming, like uh, Let's say you put an organic farm in the center uh, of a field, and the or like a field in the center, and around the, the fields you you spray your your uh, pesticides. Uh, 
and as long as you don't spray it directly on the organic farm, you can still call it organic. Organic is a, is a definition. So, okay. Uh, and modern agriculture is very energy intensive, and it's because we've industrialized it. So we do not need the population, the, 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 the uh, huge draw of the population towards feeding the rest of the population. We, we don't need that much. And that's also uh, created much more of the service-based industry that we have now. So if you look at um, what people do, uh, I mean, there, there are always going to be a few farmers uh, taking this class. And, you know, thank you, farmers, for your service to feed us all. But it's, there, there tends to be more uh, non-farmers. And almost everyone going to school, I mean, of course, we have an agriculture program, but uh, most people are not geared towards food production. So, and it's nice because we have other things we can do. We can, we have artists and we have scientists and various jobs. So social workers, all these important jobs that we, we have thanks to the, uh, that, well, a large population is, is now freed to pursue these careers rather than just food. Okay, and I mentioned a little bit before Malthus, Thomas Malthus, that uh, populations grow geometrically and food supply grows arithmetically. Okay, so so to give you an idea, if you look at my mother's side of the family, you look at my grandparents, my grandparents had eight kids, and uh, if you look at their kids, I have 27 cousins on my mother's side of the family. So you go from two to eight to 27. So you can see that's that's uh, in three generations. That is the that is the geometric growth, uh, and even worse, uh, we um, we now okay. Well, last last class we talked about uh, infectious diseases tend not to kill people like they used to. So more people are making it to um, to a reproductive age. So our population is growing fast, uh, and now we also have the food production. Anyways. Uh, Thomas Malthus said, okay, populations grow geometrically and food supply grows arithmetically. Eventually, there's going to be a, a point in time where we are going to uh, outgrow our ability to feed ourselves. And that is called a Malthusian catastrophe. So you can see here our, our population is booming uh, right now. And uh, in the Malthusian catastrophe is is when uh, the the population outgrows its ability to feed itself. That was happening around um, around 1900, and it was the nitrogen fertilizers prevented the uh, the um, the Malthusian catastrophe. So uh, it is it is unfortunate though uh, because um, actually I can go backwards. Why do I want that? Okay, so. Uh, the, the um, anyways, now we we have medicine that we're living longer, and we have all the food that we want. But the thing is, is that in uh, in the developing world, malnourishment still affected life. So uh, at some point, uh, we're continuing to grow. At some point, we're gonna have to change our habits. Uh, what are we gonna do? Uh, part of the answer is genetically modified crops. Uh, that's one of the things we're looking at. Is to be able to have crops that have salt tolerance. Can you imagine crops that could grow in salt water? That would be amazing. So we'll see. We'll get there. We'll, 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 we'll see what happens. Uh, and here is showing the undernourished population. Uh, you can see that it uh, tends to be, uh, it's not really in the United uh, North America, or at least the United States and Europe. It's more in the uh, emerging um, uh, economies. So. Uh, little bit in China and India, but not so much more in, in Africa and that region. Uh, so, but the idea is, uh, why, uh, why don't we send some of our food to them? Okay, so hopefully you've learned more about how crops work, and we're going to end this video right now.